so let's go back to those early days. I mean, the, the 1970s. I mean, I mean, these days we have you book your own seat, you book it online, you do whatever else. I mean, tell us about how what the, the process was of actually going to a concert at the Turner Sims. Oh, they were actual paper tickets. Um, and we used to order tickets from Hull, from somewhere called the Land of Green Ginger in Hull, and they printed our tickets. <laughs> And sometimes the tickets were not right, so we had to be very careful to check all the books of tickets when they arrived, and then we sold them from the office. Oh, right. And then eventually they became sold from the Nuffield Theatre. Right. And they were our booking agents for all intents and purposes. Right. And, and it was unreserved seating? It was unreserved seating. Um, Concert Society was all unreserved seating. Oh. Then it did become reserved seating. So there was some excitement over that, because mm. that's where you had to number all the seats. And yeah. occasionally, if we had to take seats out for an orchestra, we had to allow for that. And if somebody sold the tickets, that caused extra excitement. Oh, right. But that was a swift learning curve, yeah. I think, for anyone at the beginning. And, and how, I mean, we have the foyer here that we're sitting in. But of course, the foyer only arrived in 1991, 92. No. So, so yes. what was what was the the setup as an interval? I'm always curious to know what happens as in the interval. As an interval, you can imagine how narrow it was when you can see the space behind us. Well, even in the winter, the main doors opened and people stood outside. Oh, really? Occasionally, rushed to get coats. Otherwise, they were stood like this, <laughs> as if it was a sell-out concert, and a lot of them were. I remember as a, um, a coming to concerts yes, and some people couldn't standing even get out in here. The foyer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and were there an interval drinks and that's oh, yes. that, so oh, that yes. was served from behind It was the from wall. where the box office is now. Right. Um yeah. oh no, there was some wooden panelling and it opened up and there was the bar, complete with an elderly lady who dispensed coffee from a made up instant in a jug. Um <laughs> it was all immensely friendly. <laughs> Very cheap, as I remember, yeah. or good value, as we're taught to call it these days. And, and the artists themselves who came in, and we also there were some major artists. I mean, oh, ma they were truly major artists. I mean, they were very, very keen on the concert hall. It was a great innovation for a university to have a concert hall of this standard and right. acoustics of this standard. And very quickly, musicians appreciated it and were actually very keen to come, for which we were very grateful. And, and the conversations that were going on, I mean, how were those, were they, were they with agents or the artists themselves or via No, them? we booked through agents mostly. Oh, okay. In fact, I think nearly always. Very mm. rarely if there was an artist who had come as an artist in residence at the very beginning, um, then we did perhaps book directly with them. Yeah. But otherwise, it was, they were all done through agents. And of course, if you look at that list these days, I mean, Simon Rattle was here, Murray yes. Pariah was here, um, Dmitry Alexiev, the, the Leeds Piano Competition winner, was was um, was performing shortly after he won the, the Leeds Competition, as yes. uh, as many of them have since then, actually yeah. here. I mean, from your point mm. of view, Peter, I mean, that whole, the, the, I suppose, the, the development of the programme from what was essentially a very classical programme in the 1970s to, to incorporate the, the jazz and the mm. world and the folk. I mean, how did that come about? Well, um, it, it's funny because when, when I came here, I think, I think there was a bit of suspicion about me coming here because I'd been a funder. <laughs> and, um, and we... I, I had made some slightly controversial decisions about jazz when I'd been a funder and I'd sort of gained a bit of reputation as somebody who hated jazz and I arrived and I think there was a bit of a concern that that would be it, there would be no more jazz at the Turner Sims and I think one of the things I feel proudest about was when I left five years later um, the people who were worried that I was going to axe all the jazz were playing at my leaving do and the jazz programme had grown. Yeah. I think basically it was it was a programme for real aficionados of, of music that didn't have a very big audience uh, and that was fine um, and there were some really fantastic artists but it, it didn't have a big audience and so we did things um, that had already been started. I mean, you know, with, with um, networks that were around at the time, like the Arts Council's Contemporary Music Network, um, and other, other things, um, and, you know, other people kind of helped. So, I mean, one of the first things that happened was I, I turned up and somebody in the music department said, um, oh, we, we want Dave Brubeck to come. Cool. And... Um, and I thought, okay, how's that going to work? And, and there'd been a way in via his son, who was doing some teaching here. 
and Dave Brubeck has somehow been persuaded to do a concert here before he did it at the Barbican by this, this lecturer, I think via the Sun. And so that actually happened. And Dave Brubeck came to the Turner Sims Concert Hall. I had very little to do with getting in there. I had a lot to do with trying to find the money to you know, pay him, which was a bit controversial at the time because he was you know, quite an expensive artist. Mm -hmm. um, but he did come and you know, there were people like the Brecker Brothers came through here, you know, some, you know, lots of really big name British artists. Um, and I think I sort of worked on the basis that there is an audience for these people, but they're not really coming through here and we could provide something in a concert venue that isn't really being provided in this, in this area. And it, it sort of worked. So, mm -hmm. so it's, you know, it's some really memorable jazz concerts. Yeah. And I, I'd never promoted a note of jazz in my life before I came here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anybody really knew that, but yeah. uh, so I learned a lot actually. And, and we did things like started to put networks together with other promoters around the country and stuff that I think you know continues to this day mm, and has probably been yeah. built upon um, where we you know we um, brought in artists from I think we got there are a number of us promoters got to a point where we thought we know the music's out there but we can't bring it in on our own and make it work because um, you know it's just too expensive we haven't got the budgets to tour these mm. artists in so we started we put a consortium together um, and brought in some wonderful stuff. People like Uri Kane from New York, um, Brian Irvine from Belfast, who was amazing, one of the best concerts I've ever been to. I don't hear about him that much, but he was amazing. And lots of great artists sort of came in, Louis Sclavis from France, mm -hmm. those sorts of people came in, th in through those sorts of collaborations and, and really built, you know, helped us build that kind of whole strand of the programme. And I suppose yeah. the whole, I mean, the nature of collaboration is, <coughs> is that has been in evidence all the way through the history of the console, hasn't it? I mean, obviously, the music department and, and, and what happens that here. That was its original thing. intention. Yeah. It was not only to provide really top quality chamber music, as it was, but to make the concert hall accessible to the general community. It was to be a link. Um, work with schools was considered really important, as was work with young people. And of course, the music department was hugely helpful in that. We owed a lot to Peter Evans, who mm. yeah. Yeah. oversaw all that, and whose vision it was. I, together with Jim Gower, who was the vice chancellor at the time, yeah. um, we were very, very fortunate, yeah. and it gave a foundation. Mm. And the program yeah. was incredibly wide, wasn't it? I mean, you know, the, I mean, I think uh, I mean, of the the. the New music weekends in the, the late 1980s, which yeah. were done with the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra and various yes. other partners, and obviously you've got a lot of the medieval stuff and, and the, there was um, a lot which, of early music. You know, so that whole, the, I mean, the things that we've I suppose carried on today, where you've got medieval music up to music which is being written at the moment, all the way mm -hmm. through, with, with knowing that there's an audience there to actually come and see it. And people had the opportunity to learn from people like at the time Julian Breen, John Williams. Um, they mm. often did workshops with the students and workshops with very gifted young students from local schools who were offered the opportunity to come and do that as well. Yeah. yeah. And that special thing where you, you meet people who say, well, my first mem memory of music was either sitting watching a concert in the Turner Sims in 1970, 1980, yeah. whatever it was, or actually playing on the stage and then just um, going from there. Too. Can we talk a bit about the, the sort of more quirky things? Because, I mean, it's nice to talk about the, <coughs> the formal programme that you see, but, I mean, I, I've been here long enough to, to know enough issues about water coming in through the stage or various <laughs> things there. Can, can you talk about some of those elements where... What, being phoned up and coming out with a mop and a bucket? <laughs> Yeah. to make sure that the, the water had actually dried up before the audience came. I remember, <laughs> yes. I remember when I started, there was a really big supply of buckets in the place <laughs> and there was water coming. Kept behind but actually the organ the, space. Uh, behind the organ <laughs> space, which did have water in it. Uh, um, and also, I remember, um, actually not long after I started, the, the floor was replaced to the wooden floor and that involved um, taking the organ down. Uh, something involved taking the organ down. I think it was the floor. So we had a period of time where we would be working in the day into the evening, concert ended, organ builders would come in, take the organ down, work through the night, 
um, we'd come in in the morning, they'd go and have breakfast, we'd work through, <laughs> and this went on for quite a few weeks, and, and the organ was laid out in the green room, um, complete, taken down, they, and that was the point when they put the electronics and things into it as well, um, and then it was rebuilt, and that was an extraordinary period of time, <laughs> really, because there was this constant people in the building. I suppose and to make it about, work. That's the challenge of running a building, isn't it? I mean, you know, one, one can run festivals or be a funder or whatever else, but actually it's only when you've, you've sat in a building and you've, you, you've lived and breathed all the, the lovely things about an incredible space like we've got, but also the challenges of that day-to-day -day thing. Or, or the acoustics in there are so extraordinary that you do sit in there and you hear silence in a scary way mm. but actually then the slightest hint of any noise or the slightest other element which means that you're going hang on a minute i can tune into that an artist will do the same and so it, it's a it's a very fine balance isn't it to get the artists happy but also knowing yes. that, that the building's quirks don't suddenly um, jump they out say that when they're playing the sound come back comes back to them in quite a different way mm. than it does oh, yeah. in other places and once they get used to it um, they either love it or really dislike it, but on the whole, people they love people like coming work. back. They, they like, like coming back, back here. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and I we think that's easy part to attract of it. people back again. Yeah, yeah. And John Lill would always come time after time. He yes, always make sure yeah. he fitted us in. Yeah, and he, he loved to come, he and because it was a welcoming place to come. And I think that's a, that's something I inherited from you and Elizabeth. Definitely was that you know people would come in and they'd go, well, we go to other places and, you know, we don't even get offered a cup of tea. And, and actually, for me, the most important people in the building on that day were those people, because they were the ones that had to stand on stage and oh. perform. And, and as a performer, that's, you know, you know how hard that is to do night after night after night and, and how much it's appreciated when you're looked after. And I think, I think that welcoming feeling for this place continues. Being and greeted with and a cup of tea or coffee yeah. and a biscuit and knowing that we generally stayed around so that mm. if anything happened we were always we were there. there. We always fed them in the evening, often in the early days because there was no great funding. We took them home as well. <laughs> um, they slept over yeah. and a lot of artists really appreciated that because they spend their life going from hotel to hotel, never speaking to anyone after a concert. They're on a high. And then they go to an empty hotel room and life's really suddenly very lonely. Yeah, yeah. And they say hotels are hotels wherever you go. But going into someone's home and actually being able to put their feet up and take their shoes off and get feedback after a concert is mm. very well. I mean, Elizabeth was always fantastic. Elizabeth and David had open house for so many musicians. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, and yeah. remained lifelong friends with them. Mm. And I think that's the tradition we've always tried to keep, that this place is a welcoming place to come to. Yeah. And it, it counts yeah. for an awful lot, doesn't it, when you're talking to an agent or, or who, who doesn't actually know the, the venue and, and yeah. they say, we've heard from somebody that we must bring our artist here, whatever the scale of the artist yeah. is, that, that they want yeah. to come here because they it will is be something welcome. different from the, mm. the regular experience. But you see, that's selfish, isn't it, because we get super concerts for that. <coughs> when people are really relaxed and happy, you are going to get the best music. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and it's amazing how people don't understand that in other places. You know that I know, I, I've never understood it because it is the simplest thing in the world, isn't it? It's simple and pretty cheap. <laughs> All you're yeah. offering is yeah. time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and a bit of a smile. Yes. Yeah, yeah. If I can just I mean, round this off now, I mean, trying to pick up one highlight from both of you, really, oh, about, I mean, which is probably really hard because of the number of very concerts hard. you see, the number of things, or, or a particular memory that, you know, if somebody says Turner Sims, you suddenly go, oh, wow, you know, that's, that's the thing that I will always remember as being that special moment or that special memory. Sorry, I don't... Put I've got a few I can't say. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> they remain yeah. very special. Yeah. But I think the concert I remember most was the um, Bartok concert when his remains stopped at Southampton on the way through to his state funeral in Hungary. And the embassy, Hungarian embassy, had asked us to give a concert or suggested we did. Well, that was a huge honour. His son was here. Um, the music was fantastic and the hall was absolutely packed. Mm -hmm. It was a really special day, a very special day. 
And of course, we have a plaque in the foyer to mark that particular concert, don't <laughs> yeah. we? Which you know, just to, you know, and people people make um, make trips to come and see the plaque. I mean, I still get people really? asking these days. You know, is it right that Bartok's ashes were in Southampton? I said, well, yes. Here's the plaque that you can yeah. see it. So, yeah. What a great job, Peter. For you, I, I mean, it is difficult because there are so many things. Um, I I think I think getting Brendel here actually was. Um, was quite a thing um, because you know at that time he was I suppose coming towards the end of his career you know and I think you know being a place where somebody of that stature would would come and play um, I mean it took about two years you know we just sort of said we're here if he wants to play it's great you know this is what we can offer we're not the richest place in the world but you know we will and I think that sort of legacy of people knowing it was a place where artists would be looked after I think I I benefited a lot from that in those sorts of things and and that was a that was an amazing event you know tickets sold out in about three seconds and uh, yeah. place was packed and and yeah and also the fact that somebody like that um, you know who'd had you know one of the biggest piano c careers in the in the world was still very um, he was quite nervous I thought quite and very meticulous very careful I mean I remember sitting here I think it was a Sunday or I can't remember you know I remember him coming in and I had my own Alfred Brendel recital all to myself sitting <laughs> here in the foyer while he was <laughs> playing in there because somebody had to be on site you know and why, why not you Isn't know that do that and it's it's incredible you know we yeah get, we get a lot of <laughs> private concerts, yeah you do and and actually yeah that was that was wonderful really yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Well, it's so nice to And what about yours? That yes, you well. haven't said no, about yours. Come on, yeah, come on. Mine, spill the beans. Yeah. That's an interesting yeah. I suppose I, I might go for two because of the fact that I've had two. So there's a classical one, is, um, it, to be honest, is, is any of the song recitals that we've done here, where I've sat in the auditorium and watched the, the song recital of Schubert's Schoener Mulleren mm -hmm. or Winterreiser from Christopher Maltman or. Mark Padmore, those those kind of artists who have done performances of that, and and you realise you are in that really intimate environment and that really special moment where you know the sound is complete silence mm -hmm. apart from the singer and the pianist on stage. That was that one there. The other one was a American jazz artist called Steve Coleman, yeah. who um, who came in and did a concert for us on the day after he played a concert at the London Jazz Festival, mm -hmm. and. He was, he's very meticulous. He sat in um, his van outside the, order, outside the concert hall, listening through to the recording of the previous night's concert in London, so he could then tell the band where they had to improve <laughs> for the gig here. Um, and he played two sets, about 50 minutes in each half, with no breaks at all, so literally moving through all these different, um, different pieces as such, but you know, continuous playing. And it was mesmerising. Again, I mean, very different mm. from the Brendel or the, yeah. you know, the, the other things that we've talked about. But it was just captivating to sit and watch this artist in the middle of his whole quintet, really respond to him and everything, but also the audience just captivated by what they were mm. seeing. And really, whether it's jazz or whether it's folk or world music or classical, that's really what we've got in this space, isn't it? That whole ability to be drawn in by that you know, the rake seating down to the flat floor stage and you can see absolutely perfectly from wherever And the you fact sit. you can get so close. I mean, I remember um, John McLaughlin and Zakir Hussein on a tour and I'd seen them the night before on the festival hall and it was big space, you know, and, I, and they came here the night after. And I remember in the front row, there were some um, young tabla players from around here and they were sort of this close to their idol, you know, and the atmosphere was... It was fantastic, absolutely yeah. electric. Yeah. Yeah. So, they, yeah. Well, it's a credit to the hall that Evelyn Glennie came and gave a workshop mm. for local schools. Ah, yeah. And she then took questions. Now, when you think she's standing on stage, taking questions in the semi-dark from raked seating, the s mm. how did she hear? Yeah. She looked and she could see, so she explained afterwards she half lip read, but mm. she could feel the questions, mm. which I thought mm. was amazing. Yeah. And what a tribute yeah. to ISVR who consulted on the hall. Yeah, yeah. 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 made it work in the 1970s. Yeah. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Mm. Well, it's mar- marvellous that you're here. Thank you for coming yeah. and spending the evening with us on our birthday. And, um, enjoy it. <coughs> well, we're all happy as well. And um, that's it.